Good. All right, now I see some familiar faces. I know some of you were in a talk I did before lunch that was on a similar topic, and I see some faces that were not there. So I'm going to cover some of the same ground in this talk. There will be a little bit of overlap um, and a lot of different material as well. There was some stuff I kind of uh, went quickly over in the earlier talk that I'll take a little bit more time with, and uh, we'll focus on, on some different issues. So my name is Tim Berglund, uh, and I work for Confluent, this company here. Um, we're a company that supports Apache Kafka and makes uh, proprietary extensions and things on top of it. Uh, we make a, a streaming data platform based on the open source Apache Kafka. My responsibility at Confluent is I run the developer relations team. So uh, my team does training. Uh, so if you ever take a, a class from us in um, a public venue or if you work for a company where we come and teach you, that'll be my team coming to teach you. We make the curriculum. Um, we will uh, pretty soon be revamping the documentation and events like this. We do evangelism and community and outreach and things like that. So that's, that's everything I'm responsible for at Confluent. Uh, I've been there about six weeks and I'm loving it so far. All kinds of great stuff to learn and do and build and it's exciting. So uh, hey, talk to me about that after if you wanna hear more. Um, the title of the talk is Kafka in Production and let me give you a little bit of an outline. I wanna begin with the big picture before we dive into specific issues. Um, and I wanna make sure you've got the big picture about streams and streaming data and really the Kafka worldview, how it wants you to think of, uh, of really architecture. Um, it's, got, it's got some strong opinions there. Um, and we'll dig into Apache Kafka itself. If you were in my earlier talk, I went very quickly over this stuff. I'm gonna take a little bit more time with it here because these production issues won't make any sense unless we kind of know how Kafka works. So I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page. And um, these three production issues are actually taken from real life. Uh, these are actual support issues that, uh, that Confluent support people dealt with. And these are all written up in a blog post on the Confluent website, uh, confluent.io slash blog, and just scroll down a little bit. It's not that old of a post. Um, they're kind of briefly summarized there. So these are totally real life things, and each one of them kind of helps underscore a part of how Kafka works. So it's just, they're, they're nice case studies, really. They're not like super dramatic detective stories. All the best support calls would make like nice movies, right? Like they're, there's, there's some plot and like bad guys and things like that. Uh, they're, they're really not like that. Uh, they're not terribly dramatic but they're educationally super useful, at least I think so. So, hey, let's walk through all this stuff and uh, let's see where we get in 45 minutes. So, we'll start with streams. Well, why streaming? Uh, I talked in, in uh, before lunch about this idea that it seems like we're all born with that data has to go in a database. That's the right place for it to go. Is you, you, you know, things happen and you process the event and you put it into a schema and you say, well, here it is, I'm gonna stick it in this place and if we need to know about it, we'll go back to that place later and get it. So, Kafka's opinion is that all of your data is really event streams. And this isn't that crazy of an idea because if you think about it, that's what your software does, is you do process events. Now maybe the event is a request, maybe it's an actual event like a sensor reading or a transaction or something that happens in the business out, out in the world, uh, but that's really all you do is, is events happen, you process them. And Kafka is trying to have this opinion of the world that says, hey, let's just deal with them as events. Let's make them streams of events, not try and turn them into anything else ahead of time. So you could have um, a, uh, a request, really. I mean, look at this. This is some JSON. There's a timestamp. There's a user making this request. 
and it looks like somebody is looking for product detail for product 5678. Now, that's very conventional. Probably everybody in this room has written a service that will parse JSON like that, turn it into a SQL query for the relational database, get the data out of the relational database, and send it back over an HTTP connection, right? That's, that's just, that's, that's bread and butter, as we say. Um, but that's also an event. That doesn't have to be a request. We could consider that an event. If you work in any sort of IoT thing, uh, sensor data, of course, are events. Um, I'm hearing a lot from like car companies. Uh, they're super interested. They're, they're, all of a sudden, cars need to be internet connected devices. And well, there are a lot of cars and there are a lot of sensors in cars. And so there are all these events that our cars are generating. Any other kind of sensor, any other kind of IoT thing, uh, thermostats, power meters, whatever they are, lots of sensors in the world. Log files. Now, um, this is where I think streams get really cool because what, the last two things I said, you know, here, here's queries, uh, here's sensor data. Those are, those are business things. A user is doing a thing or a device is doing a thing and that's in our business domain. Logs are an operational thing. Uh, this is not in the business domain, only I guess properly what we'd call DevOps people, developers who are programming systems would care about logs. Well, logs are events. They very much are. Uh, you know, this, this last line here is a, is a new thing that goes on the end of our event queue and all of the previous entries are immutable. These are classically events. And uh, streaming as an architecture gets exciting when we can begin to integrate operational stuff that's really in the life of our system with business stuff uh, that's in the life of the business. Normally those two things don't meet. You've got DevOps people who, you know, put logs into, uh, into, um, um, <laughs> it starts with an S, I'm blanking on it. You know, the thing that, uh, that parses logs. Um, what's that? Log stash is not what I was thinking of, but that would be another thing you could do, yes. Um, no, it's not Elasticsearch. I'm not gonna make you wait for me to think of it. It's gonna, what's that? No, five minutes from now it's gonna pop in my head, I'm randomly gonna say the word. You'll know what I was coming from. Anyway, when we can begin now to intersect this operational data with business data, you can do some exciting things when those two domains can mix. But when all this stuff, when all these are events and they're all happening in a message queue, you have that option. Uh, databases, databases, can also be events. Uh, this is the, um, the uh, table event uh, or uh, table message um, interchangeability thing here. So a table is really a collection of uh, kind of key value pairs to an approximation, right? Often there'll be a key and many values or you could think of it as a tuple, you know, a bunch of key value pairs. But we could just use this abstraction here. There's a key and a value. Key one, key two, value three, value two. Over time, as that table is modified, we can think of modifications as messages. At time zero, we have key one, value one. At time one, what do we do? We add key two, value two. At time two, we still have key two, value two. We have key one, value three. We've changed a key, right? Well. Each one of those things could now be a message. The first one is a mutation, put key one, put value in at key one. The second one is another mutation, put value two at key two. The third one, we're, we're changing key one. So you can see updates to a table can be a stream of messages. Anything can be a message, anything can be an event, if we want it to be. Um, we can use this simply to store, when I say data pipeline, we can store these events. Kafka is capable of doing that. We'll look at how it does it. Um, and we can use it for real-time processing of those events. We're going to look at that too. 
Now, the historic approach to integrating systems looks a little bit like this. We've got all these applications and all these databases and all these crazy point-to-point -point connections that are more or less hand-coded. That's uh, often how we do this kind of thing. Um, if we decide that all of those changes of state in all of these places are going to be a data pipeline, that becomes one stream of events, and we have a single streaming platform that can handle that. That's kind of the promise of Kafka, right? That's what it's trying to do. All of these things that are involved with your life, your applications, a relational database, um, monitoring, um, purely uh, user-facing things like search, all of these can just hang off this streaming platform, hang off this event stream, and life is good. Now, some of these things, like, uh, like search, uh, that's an example of you might have you know, user business activity coming into this thing, you have messages, and that, that search guy there might be pulling messages off of the event stream and dumping them into an elastic search cluster, for example which is now kind of like its own little adjunct database out there. That's not heresy. That's not a bad thing to do. That is a secondary database. It's not the event stream. It's a different place to put things. But if searching is what you need to do, well, you can't really search in here. This doesn't do that. This is a queue. So if you need to do what Elasticsearch does, that's fine. It's OK. Dump that stuff in there and have a service that, that queries that cluster. That's okay to do. So you get a lot of flexibility here. Um, it is um, always forward compatible. So what happened here is a product was viewed. This is, this is what happened. We had an app and it sent a product view request into the messaging system. That was that JSON object we looked at a few minutes ago. Uh, the streaming platform might also dump that event into Hadoop. Let's say that's all that it does right now. We remember that that product view happened, so we can do analytics on that later on. We put the product view message in, and this Hadoop service over here listens, dumps it into HDFS. We can analyze it later. It's, uh, when I say it's forward compatible, I mean other kinds of things can now easily get into that product view game. We've got this message bus, we can send messages in, get messages out, do that same product viewing thing easily enough. It's easy to integrate new things with it. We've got a single interface that all those things talk to. And when that gets more complex and we have to layer on security and real-time analytics and and recommendation engine, all those things, uh, we've already got the product view message going into a product view topic, and those new services can listen to that and get their work done. It becomes easy to integrate that. So when I say it's, uh, it's forward compatible, I mean it's easy to extend the future, e or easy to extend the system to evolve the system going forward. Well, how can we build such a thing? Um, because this is uh, an extremely high level diagram. Let's actually dig into a little bit about how Kafka works. And these will be necessary details so that we can look at those uh, number three, four, and five, kind of the promise of interesting, uh, interesting production problems with Kafka. All right, so basically, what have you got? Here are the pieces, you have producers, you have a Kafka cluster and you have consumers. Importantly, producers and consumers are clients of the cluster. Uh, these are our microservices, our monolith, uh, whatever it is. These are in our application. This is an application library. You are writing this code. You are directly manipulating the uh, producer and consumer API to put messages in and get messages out. What's the fundamental data model? of Kafka. Well, it's a message queue, so it should not come as a surprise that it is a log. When I put a message on, my next write will go on the end. 
and I am not able to change these things here. Once I put something in, I can't modify it. Um, we call it a log, and, and like a, a log file, like an operating system log or a log for JLog or something like that, usually if you're editing a log somewhere up, you know, not appending to it, you're probably covering up a crime. So that's just a good rule of thumb. This is immutable, just like a log file, unless you're doing something very bad. Um, yeah, you put stuff on the end, and that's it. Readers or consumers, uh, there can be multiple consumers of a single log here, and they can have their own point that they're reading from. And we'll look at that uh, a little bit in a little bit more detail in a minute. But basically, fundamentally, it's a log, and the Writer is called a producer, and the reader is called a consumer, like we saw before. And it's not really called a log in Kafka. It's called a topic, just like in every other messaging system in the world. But Kafka is a distributed message queue, so there's a very important difference here from how this works on a single master message queue. Now, on a single master message queue, the, the traditional enterprise messaging systems, there is, you know, whatever kinds of replication they support. For a write to happen, there's one thread on one processor that you have to go to. And there is fundamentally one queue that they support. That means there's an upper bound on how big they can get and how fast they can go. But um, they can also always keep things in order. Kafka is a distributed message queue. Every time, I talk to people about distributed systems, I always try to give you a warning not to do it. Like it would be so much easier if you, if you didn't. If you build a small system, right? Don't, don't build a big system, choose a simpler life. Like you can live in the country, you can stop work at 3.30 or 4, and everything's better, everything is better. And now I know you're not gonna take my advice. You're, you're gonna wanna build a distributed system anyway. And most of us do because kind of business problems are getting bigger and systems are getting bigger. And let's be honest, it's kind of cool because we're the sort of people who think this is good. But any time you take something that you could have solved here in a single thread on a single processor and distribute it among multiple computers, something goes wrong in your life. All right, and you know, you know it. See, if you've, if you've built the system, you know it's true. And like theoretically, like mathematically, things are just bad, life is bad. Now, when it comes to Kafka, there really is only one major compromise that you're making as a result of it being a distributed message queue, and that is ordering. It is a Kafka topic, that's a, a, a namespaced collection of, of messages, and a, um, a Kafka cluster can have thousands of topics in it. It's theoretically, basically, pr practically unbounded number of topics. So having thousands of topics is not unusual. But each topic is a partitioned log. So that topic is going to be partitioned among multiple computers. We'll call that, we, I'll introduce the term in a moment. We call them brokers. So each one of these partitions is going to go on a different broker. When a producer writes, the producer will have to make a decision about what partition to write to. What have I given up? Ordering. So normally we think of a queue as a thing that's ordered. In Kafka, we only have ordering within a partition. So I don't know when I write to, you know, are my writes going like here, 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 here. I just, I don't, I can't recover that ordering. I have ordering within the par each partition, but not globally, and I can't ever have it globally if I'm going to partition. That's just a limitation. That's because of math. Um, and when you look at, like, the complexity of most distributed databases and, and other kinds of systems, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad. And it turns out at the API level, uh, w when you dig into what it really is to write the code to produce a message, um, you've got a lot of flexibility. You can have a lot of flexibility to choose, in a sense, which partition you're going to do. Or you don't exactly choose the partition, but 
um, you choose how ordering will be preserved. So you do have a lot to say about that if you want, but fundamentally, you do not have global ordering. All right, back to the table stream duality that I was talking about at the beginning. We had that, those updates to the table. Remember, I, I had the, the three different states of the table. Well, here they are. Here's put key one, v one, uh, value one, key one, value two, key two, value three, key two, value four, key one, value five. We're updating the table. And each one of those updates is a message in the log. So a table and a stream are, or at least can be, isomorphic. You see that happening in that log right there. Um, I am able to uh, create groups of consumers. Each consumer is a single thread. And each consumer is going to have responsibility for, um, well, um, every partition will only be consumed, is only being consumed here by one of these um, consumers in the group. So a consumer group is a convenient way for me to say, all right, I've got these three or two or 10 or 50 uh, servers or threads or processes out here, and I've got some number of partitions in my topic. And the consumer group says, look, I want all those partitions to be divvied up among these consumers. These are the consumers that are going to be processing the messages from this topic. I don't know how many partitions the topic has, but I know I've got these consumers. Kafka, divvy them up so I can, I can have those partitions in uh, and, and, and have this group consume those things. So I could have a single process handling all the partitions. If I have two processes, then two of, if I've got, and, and three partitions, two of my partitions will go to one, one will go to another, and if one of those crashes, uh, Kafka handles that and reassigns to the existing consumer group. So consumer groups are uh, just a, a handy way to, to divvy up a partition among uh, multiple consumers. Now, because the underlying abstraction is a log, then basically we get file system performance. When you're a database, there's all kinds of stuff. If you, if you look in detail at the write path and read path of a database, no matter what kind of database it is, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of housekeeping you have to do uh, to build indexes and uh, merge uh, log trees and whatever it is you do as a database, there's, it, it's kind of hard. Uh, Kafka, it's not that hard. So we can get hundreds of megabytes per second of throughput. You can have lots and lots of storage, many terabytes uh, per node in the cluster on commodity hardware, and writes are constant time. We are appending to the end of a log file. So um, you get, you get, uh, you get a lot of throughput. You, you never, you, you need a surprisingly small number of nodes to handle a lot of work. If you compare it to, um, you know, trying to do the same sort of bandwidth that you do in a Cassandra cluster or even in HDFS, um, you find that you need many, many fewer machines in Kafka. It's just a lot faster. Okay, and we have things like replication, fault tolerance, partitioning, and scaling those matter when I, I, we go through these failure scenarios, these production failure scenarios. Uh, we're going to have to dig into those uh, and, and look at, at how Kafka does those things. So that is our streaming platform. Ah, a question. Pardon me? Hmm. I don't like that microphone. Uh, could you please uh, move one slide back and say a few words about guarantees that Kafka provides? 
this, this slide. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I skipped over it because I can if I want. But because you asked, um, yeah, there, not much here. Um, strict ordering, we already talked about that. Within a partition, I've got, I've got ordering inside a partition and persistence. Um, so usually, all right, I, I've got a topic. That's this namespace for messages. Um, probably going to partition that. That's the whole, the whole theory here is I've got too much work to do on one computer, so I'll have chunks of that partition on multiple computers. Probably each of those partitions will be replicated. Uh, let's just say my replication factor will be three because that's sensible. I'll have three copies of each partition. Now, one of those replicas will be the leader. So when a producer is writing to the cluster, it writes to that lead replica. Maybe, and this is kind of a broader discussion of persistence, depending on how I've got it configured, when I write to that lead replica, it might also need to propagate the write to followers. So I might want to make sure that it gets written to the leader and to some number of the followers also. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll kind of stop there for time, but um, that's what I mean by persistence. It will at least be written, if I'm not replicating, done. You know, I've, I've written to disk there. Um, but I will probably also replicate it, and there are a number of configuration parameters that are going to tell me what it means for uh, the right to succeed the produce uh, operation to succeed. Question there? Either shout or wait for the microphone. Uh, since we're talking about guarantees, the question, the last Jepson test for Kafka I found was September 2013. Uh, and so the last what test? Jepson test ah. by Kyle uh, Kingsbury, I uh, suppose. Uh, 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 yes, and it showed during split brain 50% write loss. Uh -huh. uh, why it is not changing, why there are no new tests. And uh, so he directly showed guarantees are broken. Uh -huh. and there is no strong consistency. Right. Kyle Kingsbury does that pretty much with all computer yeah. programs. Right. Um, so there, he's, he's able to find scenarios in which they break. Now, you said the last Kingsbury test was 2013? Um, I don't know why he hasn't done it since then. I mean, it would be, it would be good. The product has changed a lot. The, the project has changed a lot since then, so I don't know, um, like specifically, I'm sure there are JIRAs associated with what he did, and I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know the history of those things. It's a good, it's a fair question. I just, I don't know the details. Um, and I am absolutely confident that there is some, some scenario that he can come up with, because he does it for everything. He's awesome. I, I've never met him. I'd like to. Just thank him for being the sort of person who wants to see the world burn. <laughs> hey, we need people like that. All right, anybody else? What's that? That was? 0.8. It was 0 0.8? Right, okay, so that was a while ago. Uh, hey, so uh, I have a question. Um, for example, I need to plug in new microservice to my Erka system. Mm -hmm. And for example, it needs to know what was going on, let's say, three hours prior when it was plugged in. And is there any um, capabilities to yes. get? Consumers data? can rewind. OK, so, so now we can get data retrospectively, or? Yes. Uh, uh, subject to the retention policy. So the retention policy is configurable. The default is seven days. The maximum is forever. Um, the New York Times uh, famously keeps all of their content for all of their newspapers going back to the 1860s in Kafka. And for America, that's a long time. Okay, 1860s, that's like forever ago. Um, so yeah, uh, you, can, you can go all the way back to the limit of the retention policy, you do that by an offset. Uh, you don't query, right? 
you don't do it based on content, otherwise it would be a database. But the point is consumers can rewind. Okay, thank you. You betcha. Okay. Um, any other questions? You guys are you guys are waking up. This is good. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some production problems. Because that's what we're supposedly here to do. And these are good. These help um, underscore um, the, some of the, the uh, internals we've been talking about. Now, um, although Mr. Kingsbury claims there is no strong consistency at all, um, in typical cases uh, there is, and it often, it often usually behaves like this. Um, so, uh, the way partitioning works is there is one lead partition Probably uh, two followers, um, uh, pardon me, no, uh, one lead partition, um, multiple followers. They're cluster wide, there is one broker that is acting as the controller, and we'll talk about what it does. It's just out there. So uh, there's the lead partitioner and follower partitions. Don't confuse partitioning with replication, right? Partitioning is how we scale a topic. So there could be many, many, many partitions uh, and, and uh, only probably three replicas each. So one of these is the leader, two are the followers for each partition. Let's just take a look at this diagram. Let me explain this. There are four brokers, so four separate computers. The, uh, I hope that looks black. That may, that may be a blue or a black, whatever color it looks like. This color, those are the lead partitions, and these orange guys are the follower partitions. Now, go across in rows here. Um, this is only one topic. Now, these brokers probably have lots and lots of topics on them. We're just looking at one topic in this diagram. And if you look at the top row, those are all partition one. Topic one, partition one, one, one. Topic one, partition two, 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 three, and four. Four partitions, one topic. All right? And um, there are, well, I said four partitions, of course. Three partitions, one topic, four brokers. And you see the three partitions of, uh, three replicas. <laughs> see, I get these words confused all the time. Um, Four partitions, three replicas, and the three replicas um, are on brokers one, two, and three for the first partition, two, three, and four for the second partition, and you see how they're laid out. So, um, for each replica, one broker is the leader. Have to define a new term, and that's in-sync replicas, or ISRs. The ISRs, the in-sync replicas, are those replicas that are caught up with the leader. So remember, when we write to the leader, we propagate that write to the follower partitions, the follower replicas, and um, it is possible for these replicas to fall behind and for them not to have acknowledged the most recent write. And when they do, we take them out of the in-sync list. So um, ideally, all of the replicas are up to date with the leader. Sometimes they're not. Um, for a right to be considered committed, it has to be received by the leader and all in-sync replicas. So if a replica has fallen behind, we temporarily say, we're not going to worry about you. We're, we're going to try not to worry about you. Um, if a message hasn't been acknowledged by the leader and the ISRs, it hasn't been committed, and we can't read it. All right, with that in your head. Um, Replicas can fall behind, the ISR list can grow and shrink. We can have all replicas in sync, we can have some replicas in sync, 
And what happens if it gets too small? Well, in a real world scenario uh, encountered by support, this happened, and sometimes this is gonna happen. The ISR list is gonna shrink, there's gonna be some load, you might get an alert, oh no, there are some replicas that aren't in sync, and then it clears. So in a real world customer scenario, that happened, let's say last week. There was an alert on, on the ISR list getting too small, and then it got better. Okay, moving on, right? No big deal. Then it happened again, and as, as, as far as the admin knew, nothing had changed, but it didn't clear. The error didn't clear. And they said, oh no, what happened? Well, uh, there's a bunch of digging and looking at uh, network queues and, and all kinds of things going on. Turns out, again, like I said, these, these scenarios are not detective stories, so don't be disappointed that I'm just kind of giving, giving away the ending. Uh, turns out one of the brokers had gotten uh, an update. It was running a new version of Kafka. The others weren't. That new broker fixed a bug that caused it to run faster and caused it to conclude that, uh, it caused, caused it to go faster and stay out of sync with its replicas. So the ISR list was permanently small because we had upgraded this one broker to a newer version that had fixed a performance bug. And so you had this, this permanently, uh, permanently out of sync thing. So um, moral of the story, watch your ISR list. <laughs> and also moral of the story, don't upgrade just one broker. That's probably an absolutely terrible idea. So I hope somebody was counseled. Yeah. Is it possible to update live all the cluster, all the block, block, brokers at once, uh, you real time? You usually roll those, so you wouldn't, you, you're talking about upgrade the, yeah. no, um, you would want to roll that. So you'd upgrade one, then upgrade the next, then upgrade the next, then upgrade the next. You don't want to upgrade one and then go home and come back on Monday and keep, keep going. <laughs> that, that would be the bad thing, so don't do it on Friday, ever. Um, and don't do them all simultaneously, because then the cluster would go down. But you can take replicas down. Uh, will uh, replicas uh, be automati automatically uh, re replicate on a new broker? If you take uh, one broker down, will replicas be uh, reassigned? Uh, still consistent if you have, uh, for example, a replication factor of three, uh, mm, you have uh, three replicas uh, on three brokers and one of those brokers are down or just shut down for maintenance. Will they uh, replicate uh, additional um, you know, replicas so uh, replication Factor will still met. You'll if the broker if a broker goes down, uh, yes, replicas can get moved. Uh, there's a lot. Let me just simplify so we can get through those scenarios. Yes, but there are a lot of details. Okay. Uh, tell me, please, uh, is it possible to check whether Kafka cluster is alive uh, and? in good health state. Well, thank you for that question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, of course you'd want that to be automated. There was another customer that had set this up. They had an automated health check. And they were Docker people, which is great. So Kafka was running in Docker containers, and they set up this health check that was checking to see if the producer port was open. Basically, can I open a socket to the producer port? And if yes, it's good, if no, it's bad. So that was their homegrown health check. And if they weren't able to open a socket to the producer port, uh, that, um, that broker was dead, and so they would tear down the Docker container and spin up a new one uh, with that same broker ID and, and go from there, which is great, right? And, but they had this scenario where um, they had a broker that kept failing, so they'd tear it down and bring it back up, and it would fail, and they'd tear it down and bring it back up, and fail, and tear it down and bring it back up. And they're getting all these alerts, bad, nobody likes that causing all kinds of pages. So 
uh, they're like, well, something's really wrong here. Uh, let's just bounce the cluster. There's going to be a little bit of availability. Uh, sorry. And um, well, um, the problem here is that um, more partitions, quite apart from the cluster going down, more partitions means more throughput, right? If I've partitioned a topic to more brokers, that means there are more computers available to do I.O. So, you know, in general, I want more partitions, right? But the more partitions I have, the longer it's going to take to bounce the cluster. So they took it down and brought it back up and uh, didn't realize that that was going to take, could be uh, a few minutes if they've got uh, tens of thousands of partitions to, to take the whole cluster down and back up. So uh, fast forwarding a little bit through that, um, they, uh, that, that decision to go down and come back up was a little bit surprising. They didn't, they didn't realize because of the large number of partitions that they had that that was going to be a slower operation than they thought. They thought it was going to be a quick thing. It turned out it was a few minutes, and it was super embarrassing. So uh, also, once they bounced and came back up, that node was still dead. It turns out it was just a connectivity problem, uh, a, a router configuration thing, where the automation couldn't talk to that one dumb broker. And they took the whole cluster down and brought the whole cluster up for nothing. It was terrible. Anyway, the moral of the story is automation is a sharp knife. It's a good thing. We need sharp knives. But you can also hurt yourself with a sharp knife, which is what they did. Okay. Let's see if we can get through this one remaining scenario in the next three minutes. Now, uh, let's say you're, you're old school. Uh, you're not in the cloud. You still run your, old in, your own infrastructure. It's fine. I like them. They're noisy. They smell good. The room's a little cold, but hey, you know, sometimes that's nice. Um, you finally get uh, the new servers in, you spin it up, you install Kafka, you give it a unique broker ID, uh, and you, know, you rehearse this in the staging cluster, of course, right? You add the, the broker in the staging cluster, you've got some traffic, everything's fine, uh, it's great. Well, how did you do that? Well, there's this tool called Kafka Reassign Partitions. If you're adding a broker, you're going to have to move partitions to it. This tool has a few different modes. It's got a generate mode where we tell it, hey, look, um, I want you to generate migration instructions for brokers five and six. Whatever partitions are on those suckers, just move them around, do what you got to do, create all this JSON for me to do that work. And then I'll take the JSON you generated and I'll execute it. There's also a verify mode if you want, but I, I create that JSON, I generate it. So you do that in staging, you generate, you execute, it worked fine, you go in production and it doesn't work so good. Now what you were going to do is you have these three brokers with those partitions, kind of like what we saw before. Now you're going to have these four brokers and you're going to move a couple of the partitions to broker four. That's what fundamentally what the command does when you're adding a broker. This customer, when they did that, um, they got a little upset and all of a sudden they, they ran the migration, you know, they generated, they executed, hit go, okay, this should take like five seconds, everything's great and bells started going off and SLAs were being violated, the cluster slowed to a halt. Because generate pays attention to the actual number of partitions that are in the cluster. And in their production cluster, they had one or two orders of magnitude more partitions than they had in staging, which is always the case, right? Staging and, and production are never all that similar. So they were doing this extremely expensive operation in production. So the moral of that story is uh, buy Confluent Enterprise <laughs> as an auto data balancing feature or just pay attention to your dang script, right? They did that unthinkingly and they generated the JSON. They did not look at it. They just ran it like they did in staging and that ended up being dangerous. Um, this is part of the commercial stuff that Confluent makes. Um, it's a feature that, that uh, automates the rather manual process of moving partitions around. Anyway, uh, if you want to know more, if you want to play with it, confluent.io slash download, or look for a meetup, join us in our Slack channel. I hope you learned a few things about the way Kafka works. 
we are at time. Thank you very much.